Coming up, it's midweek for Big Blue, and they turn their attention to the Washington Commanders. What went wrong in the secondary for the Giants against the Vikings, and how do they turn their attention to a very susceptible defense in Washington? We dive in, coming up next. Ah, yes, my friends, it's OGP, the One Giant Podcast, where you know that we are your hosts over here, Adam Armbrecht, over there, Andrew Makowitz. We're healthy, we're wealthy, we're wise, and we are midweek, Andy. We started to talk about it. Yesterday, I mentioned the early line against the Commanders. We'll see if that moves at all throughout this week, but we have to. We have capped off the disaster that was week one. We're still going to reference some of the play and some of the reps and the snap counts, but we need to move forward and start thinking about whether or not the Giants can get this second win of the season. Second, first yeah, win in the season. Not, week, excuse me. I'm, I am not starting my mock drafts yet for next year. Like we're one game into this thing. And as bad as it felt on Monday and Sunday, and everyone felt the exact same way, we have to turn the page and we have to look at this objectively and say, the Giants have an upcoming game against the Washington Commanders where it's within a field goal game. Vegas still thinks that the Giants are relatively there. We'll get into like what that looks like. But ultimately, the Giants have to turn the page just as much as fans do. We have to. We know we have to see a better overall product on the field. But I think there's a bunch of things that we can look out for in terms of what, what were the good and bad things from last week that may turn over into this upcoming game against the Commanders. Yeah, of course. And yesterday I talked a little bit uh, extensively about the offensive side of the football, highlighting Malik Neighbors and how he was successful. We'll touch back on him in certain ways when we look at the commander's defense and their secondary and what happened against the Bucs for them. But obviously coming out of week one, the biggest area that we all had these these question marks that came up was in the on the defensive side and in the secondary. When we look over there and we can go by snap counts if we want or percentages played where you had Cordell Flott still playing 60 percent of the reps, but spending a lot of them in the slot. You had anointed rookie slot cornerback, we thought. Drew Phillips only playing 16 snaps in this game. And then you go into the secondary where we saw Dane Belton, but he had the back concern. You end up having your rookie and Tyler Newbin go the entire length of this game, seemingly out of necessity. And I wondered, Andy, when you hear responses when asked about guys like Micah McFadden or about Cordell Flott, Dable responded with on Flott specifically. Yeah, Flott, just getting ready to go here in the first game. We thought that it was best for thing for us. Now, is that going to stay the same? Probably not, to be honest with you. Flott will probably play outside more, but for this week, that's the thing that we thought was best. While the pick six moved the needle on the score in week one, when you think about even the injuries to Cordell Flott, you brought in Dory Jackson essentially off the street. We know he has a lot of experience in the NFL. Does anything about that, the Mike and McFadden would have been on a snap count, like all these things that we end up kind of getting on the back side of it, how much of that was concerning on the defensive side with who played and who did not? Yes, yeah, so on the defensive side of the ball, I've got a 7.8 out of 10 in terms of my concern. And, nice. and I'd say First it's relatively that high because I I just don't un, I don't necessarily understand going through training camp getting valuable reps for players all off season at certain areas. And then game one, throwing all of it out the window saying like, well, we liked kind of the matchup and scheme against Sam Darnold much better doing this as opposed to what we practiced all off season. And like, I, I don't know, sometimes don't you feel like coaches get a little bit cute or they try to outsmart the other coach. And so they do all of this different stuff. It's like, why did you sign and give, Isaiah Simmons guaranteed money if he can't get on the field. Why did you draft Drew Phillips to be that nickel slot guy in the box if he's not going to get more than seven reps in the game? Why yeah. does Cordell Flott practice outside the whole offseason only to play game one on the inside? It just it feels like why would you why would you do all this stuff over the offseason that informed one thing and then just say, yeah, but for this one game to start the season, we're gonna we're gonna do something completely different. To me, it's just like doesn't make much sense other than were they trying to throw off the Vikings in terms of what matchups they were going to see. Clearly, it wasn't successful either way. 
Right. Yeah. And that's the other part of it, too. Like, on the one hand, I think sometimes you can understand it and we'll see how it develops over the weeks. And Dable basically saying, this is what we did for week one. It's not going to look the same. The Mike and McFadden on the inside and Muasau getting, you know, 45 reps alongside of Bobby Okereke. It's surprising. But then you realize that apparently maybe McFadden was only going to play seven to 10 snaps. So why bother even using him at all? Oh, OK, fine. But to your point, but it's a little like philosophically, do you think when you have less talent in a phase of your team, do you want to mix and match more or do you want to live with the results? And I wonder if, you know, with Justin Jefferson out there, I mean, it's only Sam Darnold. A lot of the QB matchups, though, maybe not in week two with a rookie, are only going to get more difficult. Maybe they felt like this is an opportunity where we can get away with doing some different things as opposed to as we work our way through the season. And honestly, in spite of the reps we saw, as you said, in the offseason, I think this also tells you they're not 100 percent sure where they want to see guys play, who's going to be on the field. And last but not least, when it comes to this, I did mention it yesterday as something we would have to touch on. And we mentioned it in their game reaction as well. The Isaiah Simmons not being on the field at all. That's the one thing where you can paint a picture about a lot of different areas and a lot of different roles. But what is his role ever going to be, especially as you see Tyler Newbin comes in and plays maximum reps at the safety position, which we expect. So he's not going to really have a role deep. He can be in and around the line of scrimmage. And we already saw in the preseason that he's not going to be a guy that you can expect to pick up as a corner out of the nickel spot. So it feels like they gave money to somebody potentially that is not going to have a clear defined role unless this team is playing from ahead in games. That's where I think his defensive value would shine. Yeah, well, and and the issue is, Adam, if Isaiah Simmons can't get on the field, Drew Phillips is only getting a handful of snaps and looked really good in it, and the and the numbers, Pro Football Focus, and other backup that Drew Phillips looked good, and you're playing Cordell pr- flop primarily in this in the slot, it just shows that they never had a plan after they missed on an outside corner in the second round of the draft. It just yep. feels like that. I'm still sitting here being like, Week One did not change anything in my mind. They whiffed on that, knowing that. Uh, Kool-Aid, McKinstry, Kamari, Lasser, all those guys were right there in front of them and they kind of got snaked and they had to pivot. And Tyler Newbin looks like he's going to be a contributor for this team. Drew Phillips looks decent, but it's like, how many snaps is Cordell, uh, Cordell Flock going to play inside versus outside? Is it Dory Jackson ready? What is Nick McLeod's outside? You know, what's his ability going into week two? I just, I feel like there's just a whole host of questions. I, I left with more questions than answers. Like, why, why did we decide to do the things that we did? Yeah, it's interesting again, and I will, uh, uh, we, we, I feel like we'll say this for the first few weeks of the season. We understand how bad week one was, but we can't carry all of that forward all the time. Now McLeod ends up getting a little bit dinged up. So then that impacts what you do too. It's mostly just, Hey, what's the sample size we're going to get? And by the way, you go over and you look at the grades in this game. Hey, top five defensive grades well, was obviously Dexter Lawrence, 92.6. As you mentioned, very limited reps for Drew Phillips, but he looked very good, 84.3. Dane Belton, limited reps again. So two out of your top three are guys that weren't on the field that much, whether from a reps or from an injury standpoint, 70.7. Pinnock had a good game, 69.2. And then Jordan Riley in relief. Now this is considered one of the top five, 63.7. Concern would be, that you have DJ Davidson, who's still up on this roster, 28.6 in his relief effort, 38.9 for Kayvon Thibodeau. And then you have guys, I actually think, even though listed as a bottom five, Elijah Chapman playing to a 42.7. I think you t- you actually kind of take that as a little bit of a positive for him in his first you know, official game. Nunez Roche, 52.7. There, uh, you know, To me, there's also a, a problem here that maybe gets a little bit overshadowed by the mix and match reps and who was available or not. Some of these things are just performance-based, and guys specifically, when we think about Kayvon Thibodeau, we talked a little bit about um, how Brian Burns and him were not as impactful as we hoped for. Those are things that you need to see turn the page here when you talk about Washington. Can, can you can you help me understand a little bit more about the interaction between Jordan Renan and Kayvon Thibodeau? I don't know if you saw that. In oh, the, well, in this, the was, question this is a classic uh, Andy on social. He, I, I knew you were going to want to get to this at some point. Well, it, it, listen, it's just like Jordan Renan's like, you know, your pass rush is where you hang your hat. It's supposed to be the anchor of this team. And I, I don't know if there's like way more history around Kayvon Thibodeau and Jordan Renan, or if Jordan Renan asked a hundred questions during that press conference, it seemed pretty innocuous. It's like, you consider yourself a leader. They trade for Brian Burns. You have Dexter Lawrence, like your pass rush is supposed to help everyone here. And it didn't. And Kayvon Thibodeau scoffed and was like, does anyone else have any questions for me other than this dude right here? It's like, well, I don't understand. And listen, I, I want Kayvon to be frustrated with how the Giants played, but it's just like, 
I don't think he necessarily played all that great in this game. We can't be showing cracks in the armor this quick on a question that seemed pretty innocuous. Now, Adam, I'm sure that you'll probably look at me and say, this is an absolute zero. It's a nothing. It's a player right after a, a tough loss. But like if Kayvon really wants to be a leader and he wants to be that alpha guy in the room, like, yeah, I feel like he's got to handle these things a little bit better, right? Yes, I, I don't. I'm, yes, it's mostly a nothing for me. It's a frustrating game. I think what does feel familiar about this, and it's not just Kayvon Thibodeau, I'd say in totality, because the way that Illuminor responded to the media after the game, even the way versus Dexter Lawrence kind of responded to the, the fans booing at the end of the game and then those reactions, it's a bad dynamic between fan base and team and players. But I also feel like it's a little bit reminiscent of years and this isn't going to be one of those ones where, oh, it was a giant, do dominant, giant defense, and the offense could never live up to their end of the bargain. The defense has a lot of questions. But we know that there's been these years over years where it's, well, we go out and perform, but the offense can't get the job done. I, no matter which way you slice this, you can look back at this game, individual performances aside, we know that take away a pick six and it's 21 to six. Take away whether or not you can get that pass into the end zone to Darius Slayton. Maybe there's a 21 14. Like, this could have been a single possession game in a world. And I'm not telling you that it was possible or that it was achievable or it wasn't one in a million shot. But I think defensive players are always going to, at the end of a game, they're going to look and they're going to, by the way, everyone knows how Daniel Jones performed. And they're going to look and they're going to say, would it have made a difference? If I went out there and I was dominant, would it really have mattered to the scoreboard at the end of the day if our quarterback is throwing points to the other team? That, that, that's where I think some of those reactions can come from. doesn't justify it. doesn't excuse it. And for a player coming into a critical third year, you obviously want Kayvon Thibodeau to continue to be one of those leaders, but I'm not going to give a week one ugly game reaction to maybe Jordan Renan, who we, you know, we like and asks a lot of good questions, but like you said, maybe needles some people sometimes. I'm going to let that one fall by the wayside. Coming up here in a second, though, why don't we talk about a team that didn't have a good week one either? And that's the Washington Commanders. Their secondary got absolutely torched by Baker Mayfield. Hard as it may be, can we squint and see Daniel Jones and this offense actually doing some damage against a susceptible unit for the Commanders? We'll dive into that in just one moment. Okay, Andy. As we said, bad week one. Didn't go great. Daniel Jones? Maybe the worst performance of his career, all things considered. Yet we find ourselves going into week number two in a division game and an opportunity to be one and one. I think if we're going to talk about, as we said, coming into the season, winnable games on paper, we don't know if there's any winnable games anymore, but at least when you sit here now and you come out, maybe we both have to accept that the Bucs are a better team than we anticipated, or it can be a combination of that the commanders are still going to be a team that struggles a lot this season with a rookie quarterback on offense. And then defensively, I mean, listen, they have weapons. We know that. But the Bucs absolutely lit up this Washington secondary throughout the game. Probably could have done more damage if it was necessary. But they had the lead, had a big gap, and didn't have to really push the pressure too much into the late game of this, uh, late quarters of this game, excuse me. Yeah, I mean, listen, if Jaden Daniels wasn't there and there was, wasn't was much, ex like if there wasn't anticipation about seeing how he performed or giving him like a learning curve, you would look at the Washington Commanders and look at their defense and, and wonder how they could be such a tire fire, Adam. They gave up 37 points to the Buccaneers. And listen, credit where credit's due. Baker Mayfield has reclamated his career in Tampa after having a terrible, you know, a, a bad exit in, in Cleveland, then goes over to Carolina. I don't know what happened there. It was like a strange, like, pit stop. Then he goes over to the Rams for a hot minute, plays, like, okay there, and then all of a sudden reclamates his career in Tampa. He has looked uh, Another good. prime example, Andy, of uh, quarterbacks that don't succeed where they start and then flourishing elsewhere. You know, we're going to bring that theme up for you all, all season long. Well, uh, uh, one would argue that oh. Baker Mayfield did succeed in Cleveland, winning okay. winning a playoff game there and looking pretty good and, and throwing touchdown passes. Completion percentage is pretty high. I, I digress. Uh, yes. You know, my issue with what happened is everyone's just kind of looking at it and saying, okay, Jaden Daniels is, is there. It's a rookie. There's a lot of learning curves there. Well, guess what? Dan Quinn is a defensive coach. And Dan Quinn yeah. brought in guys like Bobby Wagner and others to help solidify the Washington commander defense. And they were horrible at him. There was nothing redeeming. There's not. There's usually nothing redeeming on the defensive side of the ball when you give up 37 points. And Baker Mayfield had his way with that team. He had an 86 quarterback rating, 146.4 passer rating. He only had six incompletions. He threw for almost 10 yards per attempt. 
He looked great and he did whatever he wanted. It felt like he was in complete control of that game and it all falls squarely on that Washington commander secondary. If they, if you know that they can pass it all over the yard on you, you there's no way to make them one dimensional at all. And Baker Mayfield and that offense had their way. So the question you would ask is, when you look inside that box score for that game, Chris Godwin, eight receptions for 83 yards. Rashad White, obviously, coming out of the backfield there, six for 75. Mike Evans, the elite of the elite, still five for 61. And guess what? Two touchdowns thrown in there, too. Incredibly efficient games across the board. Three players with 60-plus yards. Also threw in McMillan, uh, who had just his one catch, but a long bomb of 32 as well. We can back up into the inside the, the running back room and that own agenda, but I think we'll talk about it in the trenches as we work through this week when you think about those top four guys because there's a couple of things that i can think about one i can think about how those receivers might be a problem for the giants secondary in week number two and how baker mayfield might have a similar looking stat line but i think you can also look at that and fairly easily say okay you know we don't have a mike evans yet we hope that malik neighbors can be that guy but we do feel good about what we have in a player like wandell robinson does the question mark for you maybe become understanding as we came out of that week one Jalen Hyatt clearly still has some work to do to get himself into a significant rep share is it about who's the third guy can Darius Slayton be Mr. Consistency because they spread the ball around pretty well and it did include the running back coming out of the backfield there this is where I wonder Devin Singletary dominated the snaps even after the big injury though Tyrone Tracy Jr. did get some reps here out snapped Eric Gray and I'm curious about game script in week one versus plan in week two of wanting to maybe understand coming out of seeing this box score. We, we're going to need to score points, whether for better or worse. If Daniel Jones is going to throw seven interceptions or one, we need to push it here if we're going to hang with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yeah, I mean, when you look at how Tampa exploited uh, the Washington commander defense, obviously you have Godwin catching a touchdown. You have Mike Evans catching multiple touchdowns. But when you look in that box score, Adam, you, you started alluding to it and touching on it. Rashard White and Bucky Irving out of the backfield caught so many balls. And this is what the Giants have to look at immediately to say, how can we get Daniel Jones engaged and confident in the offense early? You feel like it's going to be some of those quick screens or those quick passes to the outside. For guys like Devin Singletary, I'm looking at Tyrone Tracy Jr. I think he's going to be a guy for us to watch knowing how well the Buccaneers were able to use their running backs in the passing game. So for me, I'm not really as concerned about the third, who the third wide receiver is, whether it's Darius Slayton or Jalen Hyatt. I'm looking at it more like we need to get contributions from all over the place. I feel confident that we're going to get that from both Wandell as a possession guy, Malik from a guy that can strike from anywhere. And really I'm thinking more about the running backs being a part of this passing game moving forward against the commanders. Yeah, it's it really is interesting because, you know, even Wondell Robinson, who I highlight as being a positive coming out of week one, remember, he has that nice spin move to get away from, from getting wrapped up there and takes it for what was the biggest play that he had on the day. He had 44 yards, and he hit on his bet of the week with the over there. I think it was set at 29 and a half, so one win in the bank there. We'll talk about that more this week, too. Like, it was positive, but how much did it matter? And then game script matters, too. I talked about this yesterday. Well, could Malik Neighbors have been even more explosive on his seven or eight targets if the game wasn't out of reach where the secondary is sitting back for the Vikings and saying, what are we worried about? Keep everything in front of us. We're up by two, now three scores. We don't have anything that we need to be worried about risking. And likewise, we'll talk about getting into the matchup in the run game at the end of this week. How much can we take away from a game where you're trailing by, by multiple scores and you can't stick with your run game? You don't have an opportunity to kind of set that tone early in this one, even if some of the early samples were bad. You mentioned, too, about out of the backfield. And I'll just say, you know, the Giants tried to do that early <laughs> against the Vikings, and it led to a minus seven yard reception for Devin Singletary. Uh, you have to find a way, and this is such a cliche statement, but you got to stay ahead of the sticks here. You cannot. I thought that the play call on the pick six, as we talked about in the game reaction, was a bad decision. I thought these bubble screens did not look effective. The blocking was not prepared for those. So while, yes, I think there's things you look at that the Bucs did against the commander secondary and say, we can duplicate that. The sample size we got in week one suggests we cannot 
try to have these long developing plays across the line of scrimmage, working out into the flat, right? Like it just doesn't seem like that's a part of who we are just yet. So the quick, the quick throws, the Wandell Robinsons, even the Malik neighbors on the slants, those are the things that I think need to be incorporated most here. And then if you want to talk about backfield passing, I'm talking about Devin Singletary with that over the middle route coming out of the backfield and getting into the space. Hopefully that's vacated over the, over the middle from linebackers. Well, and, and this this is why this game against this team upcoming is going to be so important for the Giants. Because when you look at the They'll Giants, a lot. That, but, well, and, and if you look at it, the long reception of the game was that 25-yard pass that Daniel Jones had to Malik Neighbors, which some people are saying yeah. it was an excellent throw, which is why it's infuriating. Some people are like, oh, he got lucky. Doesn't matter. That, that was the one play of over 20 yards that the Giants started pushing the ball down the field. The Giants yeah. had no other plays pushing the ball down the field in that same regard. It was almost infuriating, Adam, how much we talked about how this was going to be like an explosive play offense, and then we didn't throw the ball down the field See, at all. Anything. And it could have been Daniel Jones' limitations. It could have been the defense, the way that it was presented with the cover two sitting behind you. But it was infuriating. The reason why I mentioned the Washington secondary being so critical to the Giants coming up in week two is they gave up a whole host of long plays. Chris Godwin's long was 24. Rashad White's out of the backfield longest catch was 32 yards. Mike Evans' longest was 24. Jalen McMillan had a 32-yard gain. And Trey Palmer, even though it was a 19-yarder, was almost 20 yards. They had a ton of players yeah. having 20-plus yeah. explosive plays all over the field. And this is why we talked about, like, if you're not going to get right against the Vikings, when are you going to get right? You almost kind of turn it around and say, if you can't get right against the Washington Commanders secondary after they gave up 37 points and explosive plays all over the field to Baker Mayfield, then what is the hope for this season? So for me, the Giants are going to have to get ultra aggressive. This is kind of one of those where like you're drawing a line in the sand and you're saying like we have to try to stretch the field vertically. We have to get the ball down the field, explosive plays, because if we don't do it now, then there's no opportunity for us to do it for the rest of the season. Hey, we could always do it six or seven weeks from now against the Carolina Panthers. Just wait and see. Hold your breath and it'll all come <laughs> together. Coming up here in a second, we are going to talk about some roster moves and what's going on behind the scenes here for the New York football Giants. And then one fantasy play that I think you can take a look at now if you want to invest any level of confidence in the New York football Giants over the course of this season. And as Andy just mentioned there, when you talk about those pass plays, the long pass plays for the Buccaneers, that is five passes for over 130 yards for Baker Mayfield. That's the impact that five passes had in that game. When he threw for 290 yards, 130 of them came on five plays. The Giants need to be able to at least try to do that. Whether or not they succeed or fail, you have to look to make those big plays. Let's get into roster moves and fantasy action to close out in just one moment. Okay, Andy. So we're talking about uh, what this is going to look like for the New York football Giants. Already some things that we're going to talk about going into this week. The rep counts that we saw out of week one, things shifted around a little bit, certainly. Giants still don't have a return game. They're still confused about that. They've now got Darius Slayton, by the way. I mentioned him. He's in con concussion protocol, assuming that he'll clear it and be back for this week, potentially, because it didn't seem like it was a severe, as far as it goes, version of concussion protocol. But that's a question mark for them. And as it stands right now, remember old friend Ye Jacob Johnson, excuse me, they brought him back. He's going to be into the active roster. They released Marcellus Johnson from the practice squad. They signed Cade May to the practice squad on the squad exemption. And then they also signed uh, Smith Marset to a contract and re-signed linebacker Curtis Bolton to the practice squad. A lot of these things are happening, moving and shaking, all these great things. Does it matter? Do you care? Is it impacting what happens when it comes to Sunday and it comes to taking on the commanders and how infuriating I'll just put it like this how infuriating that it is we are now entering week two and we still have these concerns about who catches the football on punts and kicks the Giants still after seemingly having solved it midway through last season Gunner goes down in the offseason and the Giants just seem willing to ride with that and live with whatever random results kind of come across the line well to, the first question is like where's Isaiah McKenzie like what, what happened? What happened to Isaiah McKenzie? Do, do you know? Gone. Like, I think he's a free agent. Why? If Gunnar Olszewski isn't able to play, why is Isaiah McKenzie, who was battling and doing all the punt return stuff, not out there to begin with? I have absolutely no idea. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. Like why have the position battle? And then one guy gets hurt and the other one can't step in and, and, and do it. I, I, I'm lost on that. The, yeah. Do I, do I care about all this? 
Not necessarily. I think the Jakob Johnson thing is slightly interesting to me. One, he's a really good run blocker. And maybe they're saying, we got to establish the run. Like, we 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 can't be a pass-first team because we don't have confidence in Daniel Jones right now. The other thing about Jakob Johnson is, is he going to take away snaps from Daniel Bellinger? It does seem really weird that, like, they invested a mid-round pick in Daniel Bellinger. It felt like he was doing pretty well. And now it's like Theo Johnson is the guy that's leading in snap counts. You're talking about Chris Manhurts being out there and blocking. Is is Jakob Johnson now going to be taking away uh, snaps from Daniel Bellinger as well? So, like, I think it's he's noteworthy because he's not just a back fringe guy. He's a guy that will get reps if he's on the active roster, especially knowing his prowess in the run game. Yeah, this is one that I mentioned uh, yesterday just in terms of, of snap counts and PFF grades coming out of this one, and it was very notable to me, and it actually leads to my one fantasy play. Listen, I don't know what it's going to look like long term. This is kind of, hey, you want to take a flyer on someone, but you mentioned it. Theo Johnson is arguably the only offensive-minded tight end that they have in this room. We understand that Daniel Bellinger is capable of it, but when you get snap counts that have Daniel Bellinger playing 16 Chris Manhurts blocking tight end playing 20 and then Theo Johnson playing 61 out of the 70 snaps in, in week one. And guess what? The PF grade F grade wasn't perfect for him. But if I'm thinking about needing to be more dynamic offensively and wanting to stretch the field and having someone capable of going over the middle for better or worse, like I, we like Theo Johnson, we like the draft pick. I think there's a lot of pressure on him now as a rookie. And they're, by the way, swapping out their fourth round tight end that they that they drafted for a fourth round tight end that they drafted. But it looks like it's going that direction. So when you see Johnson get elevated, the first thing I think about, which we'll talk about going into this game preview at the end of the week, is run blocking because it was, even in a smaller sample size from a snap count for the offensive line overall, the weaker of the two phases in offense. So maybe they're talking about, hey, how do we make sure we get Singletary some of these holes and help out some of the offensive line that maybe is struggling a little bit in Van Roten, in JMS? So that's the first one. But to your point, where where are the reps going then? When you get into 12 personnel, you're going to feel even stronger about using Manhurts and Johnson now maybe. Or maybe you're going to end up putting Johnson in the backfield as a fullback. And then you're going to, you can say, okay, Daniel Bellinger will be out there in 12 personnel in those situations. Will he? Or will it end up being Theo Johnson? So you have the versatility. This is one that we would say egg on our face about. I already mentioned it once and we were fine to be wrong about these things. But it does seem alarming that in week one of the season, you saw this dramatic shift. And if that's the case, by the way, the reason why we thought it wouldn't it wouldn't happen is because Daniel Bellinger was on the roster the entire time. So now what's going to happen? You're going to have a guy you kept on the roster and it's going to get absolutely buried and only see 10 to 15 reps a week. Just confusing things are happening right now in a lot of key areas. But I would take Theo Johnson as a flyer if you wanted to have a bench tight end in your league. He's offensive-minded. I think they will try to get him involved. And if Malik Neighbors starts to garner more attention... And if even Jalen Hyatt or Darius Slayton or Wandale Robinson, I think Theo Johnson has an ability to maybe make a little bit of hay in a game where he is going to be the third or fourth thought about weapon for the Giants. And that says nothing about Devin Singletary and pass catching running backs out of the backfield. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I don't know how far I would go into Theo Johnson in this particular matchup. I feel like the running backs and the wide receivers are, are where my mind initially goes. But to your point, hey, if you're going to play, six, you're gonna gonna play be 61 there reps, I'm going to tell you right now, and I, I agree yeah. with you, but if you're going to play 60, 61 reps, you better be seeing something. Otherwise, why are you out there? Because right now, Theo Johnson's not a blocking tight end, so who knows? Maybe you're right. You pick him up and you find out he only sees 20 reps this game because the Giants aren't even concerned about it. Yeah, the vo the volume and the snaps are there, so I completely can appreciate like, well, you're there to catch the football. You're on the field constantly. What <laughs> yeah. What is going to happen? And, like, so, so I totally get that. Where my initial head goes, and we talked about this before, my my thought goes squarely to Tyrone Tracy Jr. It's like if they're yes. going to have a dynamic guy that can catch the ball out of the backfield, this game screams for him to have one of those like breakout type type of games. He, I'm going to be very curious to see what the snap count difference is between him and Eric Gray, as well as Devin Singletary, knowing that like, hey, if pass catching is going to be extremely valuable against the commanders out of the backfield, what is the, what does the snap count, snap share look like between those three running backs? At the end of the day, my belief is that the snap count that you saw, and I agree with you, I, I think it's going to be the kind of split we saw in that backfield. We'll talk about it more, but that 15 to 8 or 15 to 7 that it was between Tyrone Tracy Jr. and Eric Gray, let's remember, Eric Gray, his best value is going to be when you're in a tight game and Singletary needs relief and you want a guy that gets north and south and can have some of that punch and burst. So his role got mitigated in week one. 
I have, listen, he's one of my stashes. I don't, I, you know, I picked up Tyron Tracy Jr. in the fantasy league to say, what could happen here? Now, obviously, week one told me that maybe nobody matters on the Giants from a fantasy perspective. But in this game upcoming, Tyrone Tracy Jr. getting some more pass catchers on the field, knowing that he started as a wide receiver. Maybe you see him flexing out, especially if Darius Slayton is not going to be able to go. You're going to need more pass catchers on the field more often than not. That being the case, my friends, we will, of course, come back in. We're going to have Thursday night football tomorrow uh, that we'll cover and give our picks for. Wasn't a great first week for OGP. And from that standpoint, we'll talk about final matchups on Friday, give our picks for Sunday night football, our uh, high bets of the week for Andy, obviously. We're going to be talking about our favorites and our underdogs. So still a lot to go here, plus key matchups, getting into the nuts and bolts of it and finding some way to tell you that Daniel Jones, in spite of it all, could have a bounce back week because if he doesn't, this could be the last week for him as a starter for the New York football Giants. In the meantime, you get us on YouTube, you get us over on your podcast feeds, you check out our sponsors if you're so inclined. But until next time, until the best times, as Andrew Mackowitz would want, need, and nay, demand the people know. As always, let's go Big Blue.